history program, the Limerick Historical Society, with uh, me, Tony Brown, and as usual with uh, my, my sidekick, uh, Tom Donovan. Tom, Thank welcome you. to the program anyway. Thank you, Tony. Thank now, you. Uh, tonight we have a new, uh, a different guest as usual, and we have with us um, Rob Dean. Now, Rob Dean will mean nothing to some people, I suppose, and he's living out in, in Durban, which isn't out beyond Balinanti. It's out yeah. down in, in, in South Africa. He's a long way from home. You're welcome to the programme, Bob. Uh, Rob, I should you. say. How far are you away from, from Limerick, roughly? How many miles would you be to, uh, to Durban? Uh, to, 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 I'll be about... I six or seven thousand miles, I'd say. <laughs> a long way. You wouldn't actually cycle it anyway. Now, no, I should... there's, there's some people who've done that, but uh, I certainly wouldn't try they, that. They want, they want to go and see the psychiatrist after it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I should tell people out there that people now will want to see this, uh, this, this video. But um, I should mention Rob, incidentally, is whether he liked this or not, he's the ninth Baron Muscari. Now, people will say Muscari, isn't that in Cork? People will associate that in Cork. But I'm sure people out there will, might remember his father, whom I knew well. And uh, his father, of course, was the eighth baron, uh, and, and I think the 14th baroness, you are, yes. of, uh, of, of Muscari. Yes. And uh, I suppose the deans had a lot of land in uh, North Cork mainly, and we could go into the history in another few minutes of some of the dean family going back. But you decided to live in, in, in Dublin as opposed to Dunkelahor. Why? Yeah. Well, you know, I was born in South Africa because my father was um, a doctor. He went to Trinity and he qualified in Dublin. And at the time he was um, sponsored by the church. Uh, and one of the conditions was that when he qualified, he had to go and work as uh, a doctor in first he thought he was going to India but at the last minute they sent him to South Africa so he came to South Africa and uh, he married my mother in 1944 and I was born there but when I was nine my dad and mom went back to Ireland so I then went to school and university in Ireland so I, that's how I came to be in Ireland obviously through my father and the family and yeah so i've been between ireland and south africa for many many years your mother, was your mother south african my mother was south african yes right yeah. and is she any irish ancestry um not as far as i know um what was her name? she was her her ancestry came out uh with i think the 1820 settlers who oh. they were as they were called um yeah. obviously they left england for uh, greener oh. pastures as they thought <laughs> in south africa and yeah so her family goes back that far but that they were originally from somewhere in england and how did she settle in ireland sorry how did she find, how did what did she think of ireland she came here. Well, she, she lived there for many, many years. So she 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 loved it. Yeah. She also she also liked to go back and see family in South Africa. So they used to do regularly every few years a trip to South Africa. So but she settled into Ireland and um, she enjoyed it. Yeah. I can remember when your father then he, he came here to work for what was known as the the, the help board, really, I suppose, before, well, they eventually became the Midwestern Help Board. But your father was the radiologist uh, out in the regional hospital. That's correct. And I remember he'd been there, and I remember passing the doorway and seeing his name up on the, on the thing, and then Lord Muscovy. And I said, how could Lord Muscovy to myself be walking here? You know, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't take it my head around this, yes. this titled person being here, working in the regional hospital. But then when I got to know him afterwards, you know, I have to tell the story about the green jacket. I've told this, to, 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 <laughs> I must have told this to what, 50 people over the year. Your yes. father, oh, that's why I got to know him. He, he was looking for a green velvet jacket, which is a dark green velvet jacket, which I said I'd made for, made for him. Betty brought him in for me. And... In the, in, in the same week, another friend of when he was a friend of mine at the time, he's just since died, Frankie O'Connor, wanted a green velvet jacket. 
which is very unusual for two people to want the same color green velvet jackets the same week. Made the two jackets, tried on the one on Frankie, perfect, and for, before I finished it out, and your father's tried it on, and perfect. Your father came in about a week later for his jacket, perfect, took it away with him, and uh, he rang me the following day to know what I'd done to his jacket. <laughs> I said, what did I do to his jacket? The jacket was perfect on him, as he said. So I said, what is the problem with it? He said, when I put it on, he said, it's too big for me. <laughs> it was then the penny dropped. I'd given him Frankie O'Connell's <laughs> jacket. Frankie was 44 to 46 chest size. Your father was about 36 to 38. So when he put on the jacket, it must have went halfway across the room when he put his, <laughs> when he put his, his, his arm into it. <laughs> and I should, I should have gotten him to put it on before he left. But it didn't matter because I knew it was, it was perfect. And Frankie's were, but I, it was, oh God, thank God. That's all it was. Uh, all I had to do was switch the jackets. To, if, Patty, uh, if Frankie put on his one, he wouldn't have got his arm into it. And <laughs> the jacket, you know, where it's yeah. But I will never forget the, a simple mistake. But luckily, it was nothing major anyway, you know, that I was able to rectify it, you know. And, uh, I remember asking your father then about the Muscari title at the time, because I was I was fairly younger, obviously, and I had only a, a small interest in titles and that. And now I, I think I bore people to death talking of titles and how people acquired them over the years, you know. Anyway, getting back to, to Durban. What first of all I should mention, it's raining here at the moment. What's it like in Durban? Well, it's it's uh Durban is a very subtropical climate. It's um What's the time? About just after nine o'clock. The temperature is about 25 degrees. Uh, it was about 35 today. Uh, it's very warm and humid, but it's a very easy climate. I mean, you know, we don't use jerseys. Midwinter is the best time here. The average daily temperature in midwinter is about 25. So Yeah, but what are you calling winter from when? Our winter, our winter, our winter is, 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 is starts, it's opposite, it's exactly when your summer is. Oh, yeah. so we're, we're, we're opposite. So now we're in midsummer, which is a very hot and rainy time. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a you know, beautiful oceans here, beautiful climate, yeah. but, but it gets very warm and humid in, in the January, um, February into March are very humid. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, but it is a, an easy climate in that, in that respect. It's yeah. nice. We don't have, we don't have, we don't need to have heaters or anything like that. Yeah. We do. Anyway. I know. Back, oh, I, <laughs> I know. Getting, getting back to the Muscovy title. Um, your father, I should say, and, and you were, were talking about Drum Collahor. Well, between Drum Collahor and Bradford, really, hmm. is Springfield. And I'm sure a lot of people know the entrance going in. Because on the wall, there is a plaque to Dahi O'Bruder, of course, who was mm -hmm. one of the last Gaelic poets, who are yes. well known. In the, in the, there's a yes. statue actually yes. in the village yes. of Bradford to Dahi O'Bruder that was only put up about, about 15 years ago. It's 10 years ago to 15 years ago. But the deans were mainly from Cork, a yes. Cork family, who had a lot of land. And I think there was one of them even a mayor of Cork at one stage, of the city of Cork, going mm -hmm. back. But do you know? Do you ever come across any more about the Dean family themselves, Tilson Dean, and you know how the family got its its title in that? Well, the for for quite some time, the first um, the first baronet was I think seventeen ten who got yeah. given the title for some dubious support of the, <laughs> the English crown. I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure what he did, and um, then in in seventeen eighty one. Um, the the first Lord Muskerry got his title as a result of he obviously supported in the Parliament some uh, legislation which the British uh, were um, trying to push through. So as mm. that was that was his sort of I suppose his reward, and um, he he was a, a an MP in Cork. In, in that area, so when he when he got awarded the title, he chose the Muskerry, which was the area where he was the member of parliament for. So he 
chose that. But that was an old title where the Lords of Muscari, the McCarthy's, the McCarthy's. had previously had that. And then the McCarthy's lost everything through all of the, the, the problems that and, and, and whatever happened in Ireland. And he chose that not because it was particularly that because it was the area, apparently. The area, yeah. Well, it's yeah. supposed to, as you know, have, have, have land or property in the area yeah. that you take your the title from, you know. And, and then, but, yeah, and then, what? sorry, and then he he um, eloped with Anne Fitzmaurice, whose um, father, or uh, might have been grandfather, had... The, the Fitzgeralds who had owned Springfield prior to that, and I'm sure you know all this, but they, they lost, they lost, they had all their um, confiscated. It was the third time they had it confiscated. Previously, they had got some of it back. And uh, that was, uh, I think, about 1690-something, and they lost it, and um, Fitzgerald went to to France to fight the English, where he eventually died. But then the Fitzmaurice, he bought the property of Springfield, which was sold by the Crown. I, I presume it was the Crown. It was, yeah, yeah. For 5,005 guineas in 1701, or thereabouts. So yeah. that's uh, the connection, and... and, he, and, and, and um, Robert Dean, the first baron, was scary. He eloped with Anne Fitzmaurice because he never had much money. He was an absolute spendthrift. He just wasted his money. And she had, obviously, she was the sole heir for Springfield and all those lands. And that's how, that's how the, 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 the deans came into the, into the Springfield. Yeah, yeah. And, oh, yeah. yeah, Tom, you've been to Springfield, haven't you? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with the townhouse. There's an old townhouse there, belong to the Fitzgeralds. There's actually a picture of it in the book on the Knights of Glen. because it's a picture with the Fitzgeralds. Oh, yeah. 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 So. Oh, yeah, I forgot that now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think the tower house was restored recently, wasn't it? Did some yes. Work? Yeah. Yes, we, we've 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 we we started a, a restoration uh, under um, Jonathan and Betty. They yeah. obviously run the place. And uh, we started a, a restoration of the whole place in 2006. Wow. And in 2013, we um, eventually got permission to uh, do certain work on the old uh, Irish Tower House, it, which was the original one. It says the original one was 1298. And we're not even sure where that was. Or, but then about... 14 or 1500 that particular one was built and there were lots of alterations done over the years it was burnt a few times and no, a million no, and so, on. Okay. so, so uh, we, we put a new roof on it and and redid it then a couple of things first of all i should say to you that uh, in a sense you're lucky that the title was given before 1800 because when you know it or not it's uh, 1781 whereas in 1800 about 70% of the titles were because of votes for the union. And they were given out, just yeah. passed out. Most yeah. of the titles, yeah, like Lord Donnelly and a few more, they're all 1,800 titles. The mm. people that voted for the union got titles. There's, yes. a, great, there's a great book, there, a very bitter book by Jonah Barrington on the titles. He lists all the people that voted and how much they got <laughs> in, in, in 1800s. For 1801 with the Act of Union. So your title is 17, uh, 1781. So it was given, whatever it was given, it was given before 1800, anyway, that you could yeah. even claim that much. You were, you were the three titles that were given out. You were brought up a step. You know, if you were a, if you were um, a Viscount, you were brought up as an Earl, and the Earl was moved up, you know, into Marcus. All the titles were moved up a step if you had voted for the Union. And yes. uh, Barrington's book is very, or okay. he's a very, he was a very bitter man. Did they have a seat in the House of Lords? You mentioned no. one of the Sorry? No, they were Irish. Your titles are Irish titles. Yeah, yeah. So they didn't have a seat in the House of Lords. Well, my my um, great-grandfather... Was MP. 
he he died in 1929, or he was probably a more of a great uncle. He yeah. sat in the House of Lords. Oh, did he? He did, and he, he was very much involved in um, the British Navy in, yeah. in terms of legislation and all that sort of thing. So he he sat in the House of Lords, and there's sort of I've got some records about what he, he was seemed to be mainly the the Navy and the concern about what was happening in that. But his son, who was Bob Muscari, who in, inherited Springfield and the title in 1927 or 1929, when he died, he, he, he wasn't interested at all in that, um, you know, the, the House of Lords or anything else. He was mm. more, in, although he spent a lot of his life in Australia, but he came back and rebuilt the place which had been burnt down um, in 1921. Mm. And, um, yeah, so. But he would have sat as a, as a, I don't know how that would have worked off the top of my head. He, would have, he wouldn't have sat as a bum, he would have sat as a bumness. And because the Irish titles, you couldn't use, in other words, like, um, let me think of an example, the Earl of Limerick, for example, he mm. would have been an Earl, but he, when he sat in the house, he would have sat as a baron. He would have been Baron Fisherwick. The Irish titles hadn't the same prominence as no. the English titles. You had to go down a step if you could follow what I mean. You know, yes, the, I yeah, the, the, the Marquis of Donegal, for example, now would have sat again as a, as a, he wouldn't have used the title Marquis. He'd have been a step down when he sat in England because they're lesser yeah. titles. But that's the way that, that they were giving out. That. Would you ever, do you ever use the title? I'm not saying there's anything wrong because now did she quit outside now? Uh, Conor O'Brien, he uses in Chiquin all the time, which he keeps it up for, for history as well. You know, would you, yeah. would you would, in South Africa, you say, would it be recognized? Oh, well, you could, you can call yourself what you like in South Africa, but it, it doesn't have any re real relevance to people here. I mean, you know, that, that, that sort of history, um, because of the huge number of different people from different countries and different races and different cultures, it it doesn't really mean much to some. If some say to somebody, "Oh well, I'm Lord Muscari or I'm Baron Muscari," they would say, "Oh well, okay, <laughs> that's what you are." But it, it, you know, there's there's no history for them to that. So yeah, yeah. I I I um, <clears throat> don't use it, but sometimes because of correspondence and interest, people would. Uh, send me something to and and address me in that format. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, to me, it's it it's something to do with history, and it's interesting for that. It is. It the is. The title in itself it is. is is yeah. nothing I've done. You know, to say, well, why should I be uh, honoured by being that? So I like the history of it, and I think it's lovely to have it. Yeah. But its its relevance today is. Um, kind of minor, to say the least, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I said, I don't tell me it's that. Not, but I, 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 will, I will keep that in our family going. Oh, God, yeah, 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 it should, yeah. I think it's important for them to know that and, oh, and so on. Very important, very important. Yeah. Thomas Glenn, what way did United Glenn, who we were friendly with, what way did he title himself? Desmond, oh. Desmond Fitzgerald. I addressed him as nice. Right yeah. yeah. Yeah, he, we, we always knew him as the Knight of Glynn, you know, like... Yeah, but the, uh, what did he a, sign this time, that? What can you remember? Uh, he signed the Knight of Glynn, or, well, depends who he was writing to. Like, if he's, if he's familiar, he put Desmond, but if he was writing to an official... Yeah, passion, he put Knight of Glynn. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there, is there a, a son and heir, Rob? For me? Yeah. Yes. Yes, there is my son, Jonathan oh, Fitzmaurice Dean. <laughs> that was my next question. <laughs> there is a son. Oh, yeah. But it's a title we carried out for another while anyway, because the yeah. Glynn title now is gone yeah. after the night. Yeah, no, it's to, gone. Because to, to that was, yeah. 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 It's, it's a pity in that sense, you know, that the title isn't, isn't oh. carried on. You know, it is a pity, you know. Anyway. And was it just. Yeah, he's he's very, he's very interested in, in, in all of that and the history. So he's. And he, go, he goes to Ireland quite often, um, oh. you know, when because we, we normally go there 
my wife and myself, we normally go two, maybe three times a year. And often we've we've gone with family. And in fact, we have a whole family gathering there in um, July, um, subject to COVID, of course, which has really messed up things. But yeah, he's very keen on that whole history and he's doing a lot of research and he's very interested in, the, from a historical point of oh, view, yeah. what it's yeah. about. That's good. And uh, was in your family, you had Betty and yourself, was there other siblings? No, just Betty and myself. Okay. And your wife, wife is South African as well, is she? Yes, my wife, Rita, she's South African. Right. Um, she's, um, her ancestry is Danish and um, on the one side and, and um, English on the other side. Yeah. So, you know, South Africa's got a just huge mix of oh, yeah, yeah. everything, yeah. yeah. But you're a long way even from, from Cape Town. You just get this thing into your head, as stupid as it is, that you could kind of drive for, for have, your, have your afternoon tea uh, and have your dinner in, in, in Durban and drive on that night onto Cape Town, that it's only kind of up the road, you know, from Durban. Well, Cape, Cape Town is 1,600 kilometers from Durban. So it's, it's yeah, so it's, it, we, we, we sometimes drive down there um, and driving time is about, six, there's a very good roads. So it's about 16 hours drive. So you drive and stop for the night and the next day, next afternoon, you're in Cape Town. It's much easier to fly. It's a two hour flight. Yeah. It's just that you get this thing about countries when you're not there, but there are, so it's like Australia, you think there are kind of, like one is yeah. up the road, like Ireland, you see, you start thinking of, you think in terms of Ireland, everything yeah. is close by, and there's nothing more than three hours away, you're at the furthest, so you yeah. kind of wonder, you know, but anyway, getting back to the Moscolies again, uh, when, when you read on the, on the Moscolies, that the power that they had at the time, in Cork mainly, you know, that there were so many of them involved in Cork and how they came up when they bought the land outside in the, in Drumcolour, just so, I suppose, really so far away for them, having to move up from Cork up to up to Drumcolour, you know, but I suppose they, got a, they probably got a good deal because out in the back of the of the, the house, there's a, um, a kind of a statue of, of, a, of an ape up on yeah. top of a... Of a, of a uh, what would you call it? Like a memorial, like, and that yeah. is the ape that's on the crest of the Fitzgeralds. That's correct. That yeah. Is, yeah, because there's a story that one of the Fitzgeralds was was he saved by an ape at one stage? There's one of the men who was well, saved. There's there's two stories about that, um, and and the that story is in the Fitzgerald legend, and um, the one story was that there was a fire in the in the castle. And this pet ape um, took the young child, the young son, w and grabbed it and took it away from the from the fire and saved it. So it became, um, I don't know, an important part of the Fitzgerald history. The other story is a bit different. It was uh, it it was about there was some battle and the Fitzgeralds were being besieged, and the ape grabbed the child and ran along the battlements, holding the child by the leg and waving it. And the people who were attacking decided they didn't like to attack this place. That was the other one. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of stories being spun around that, but it's definitely very strong in the Fitzgerald. Oh, it is, because it's actually on the crest of the, of the Duke, Duke of Leinster. His crest has the, the, the ape on it. Have you heard those stories, Sam, about the yep. ape? Yeah. yeah. I think, I, no, to me, I, I think the origin of the ape is probably forgotten, and the stories are built around it, as Rob yeah. said. You know, uh, they, they sound a bit fanciful, but who are we, who are we to judge? You know? Maybe it did happen. <laughs> yeah, who knows what happened all those years ago? Yeah. You. <laughs> but see, also, another thing that comes to mind, when you're going out, when you're coming out from the Castle West, and you're coming towards under, call it the Drum Collar Road, Hmm. You come to a point in the road. This is only something I've, I've noticed myself. You come to a point in the road where one road goes to Broadford and one goes to Drumcolour. Yes. And as far as I'm concerned, that is the beginning of the of the Moscow estate. 
Mm-hmm. It's like the hardest thing of, was it 540 uh, square miles, Sam, or what? 640. 640, is it? Square yeah, miles. That, that, uh, they, they, they always claim to have, most of the landed families. And I think when you have this division of two roadways, going one to Drumcolor or one going to Bradford, to me, that is the, the encompass of the of the estate. Because I also have this theory, when you come out of a, of a big house or an estate, and you turn left and keep turning left, you'll eventually come back to the gate, <laughs> come back to the gate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've proven this so many times. People have said, nah, I don't know. But there's something that I, it was kind of their own personal estate, apart from lands that were rented, you know, that this was kept by the family. And yes. the thing again was, I keep forgetting, what is it again, Tom? Six? Six, 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 six four. I should write that down. 640 uh, uh, square miles, was it? Not square miles. Acres. Six, what, 640 acres. Yeah. Acres. 640 acres was kept by the family for their own personal use, which that could... Uh, some, there's, a, there's a graveyard in, in um, beside... Oh, Springfield. Springfield. Yeah. Is that where the deans are buried? or? Yeah, well, they are, there are... Um, if you if you look, there's a there's a graveyard up. Uh, it, it, uh, if you're aware, up on the top of the hill there, which is a, a graveyard for um, everybody in the village in the area. And, and my parents are buried in that graveyard. Yeah. Um. The 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 previous scaries are there's a family tomb just near the near that uh, graveyard mm. where they are interred. There, there's four of them. And that was Bob Muscari. I think he had his father and mother buried there, and him and his wife were buried there. And yeah. my parents chose to rather be buried in the local graveyard, just in normal graves. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, they so they are buried there. And then there are there are there are quite a lot of Fitzmorrises, very old graveyards that uh, that are they're up in the in in the, that graveyard on the hill. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Sullivan's brother John did a study of the graveyards. Um, you know, Shay, Mr. Sullivan, the I know, I know John, I know, I know Seamus as well, very well. Oh, he did, and, yeah, John, uh, yeah, yeah. John, John, John did, did a study of the graveyards. Did a, I met him there one day up at the graveyard, yeah. Uh, the first time I met him, and we got chatting, and then he told me he was doing a, a like trying to trace a whole lot of things that were happening, it was very interesting. Yeah, and I know Seamus quite well because um, he did a, 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 a lot of work on the, yeah. on the Fitzgeralds and their history yeah. and so on. And well, um, I got to know him quite well because we had Seamus on this on this program. We had Seamus on one of these programs about yeah. God it must be last September. I'd say was it time um, we had Seamus on. Yeah, yeah. she was very funny because Seamus wasn't Seamus wasn't used to, to use to. Do. Yeah. He, was, he, yeah. he was funny. He, he kept talking. But I, I think he kept talking. He forgot sometimes he was on camera, you know. Yeah. And you should check it out. You'll get it with these videos, you know. Yeah. You know, go to the Limerick yeah. Historical Society. He wrote a wonderful book on, on the famine in Limerick. It's, it's a fantastic, uh, very well researched book on the famine it has, with an emphasis on the local area and it shows how it affected it. Have you seen that, Rob? The book on the this book, I have it. Oh, have you? Yeah. 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 yeah, I have. I, I when when we had lots of family um, come over on one of the trips, yeah. um, we we actually um, quite a few of the people who uh, came there they they acquired that book and they read it. They found it very interesting for to see from a local a perspective of you know because you read history, yeah, and the real story lies with what locally happened, you know, the real detail. And it, it, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But James does a fair bit of research. He's always he at it, you know, doing research on various things, he's, you know, over the years, but he's very good. Anyway, get back again to talking about Springfield. A lot of people out there don't even realise, good and bad, that they don't even realise that Springfield is there as yeah. an estate. Because when you go to the gates, you see this long drive in, and you, you you really don't watch at the end of the at the end of the tunnel, you know about <laughs> about driving into Springfield. But it's a lovely place outside, and they had a fair bit of land, which with the land accident coming in, a lot of it was taken. 
at last. Mm. But I was, I've never come, I, never, I should have checked tonight before I came out, what was the, the original holding in 17, I mean, 1878, there was a huge book, which I have a copy of. There was a huge book there on land holdings in Ireland. And it mm -hmm. gives you the, the, the valuation of each, what, what each landlord had in land. Yeah. And, uh, but like that, there, there's much change now. Even a lot of the names have gone. It had big holdings. If you look at the land registry, which because I've done some research on it, yeah. In in 1841, I think it is, that under under uh, the Muscari who was there, or the dean, they had 3,460-something acres. Whether they, you know, that would, could be leased out or whatever, but that was a, a figure as registered. And then they had land in Tipperary, okay. and they had yeah. land yeah. in Waterford, too. Yeah. They had some land. Yeah. And at one stage they had an enormous amount, but but the the um, the generally the deans uh, a lot of them um, were not very good with their money. <laughs> yeah. They they ended up in all sorts of debt and they had to sell land and all sorts of things. Yeah. yeah, especially under what was known as the encumbered estates, and half lot of estates had been encumbered in eighteen fifty, and yeah. they had to sell. Sell out. Gambling mainly, mainly through gambling. You know? Yeah, <laughs> that's gambling, that's for sure. That a, a lot of landlords live beyond their means, even without defending. You know, like yeah, oh, they do. Yeah. Unless they married well, they were in trouble. You know, uh, they got a big job. They lived. Yeah. From yeah, they were all living beyond their means because yeah. they had they had this um, perception of how they had to live, but they they, they couldn't support it easily. Oh. oh, yeah, that is true. Did you ever hear the name uh, mentioned Plummer? Yes. A Mount Plummer. Mount Plummer, yes. Yeah, which is gone. I remember discussing that with James, that the, it's gone altogether, which is a shame. Nothing, there isn't a trace that is really left of Very Mount Plummer. Little, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and the big landlords on the other side of, of with the other side to you, like, but unfortunately, the whole thing is gone. Did you ever hear of anything about concerning the Plummers? No, you know, I heard the name Amalfit and Mount Plummer, but I didn't, I have no detail, you yeah. know, as, as I heard that things like a child when I heard these things, and, but you know, you don't take too much no, notice. No, but, no, unfortunately, you know. What's that? I, love, I, love the name, I love the name Brudenel, Brudenel, Brudenel Plummer, yeah, uh, yeah. it's a name that they carried with them, Brudenel. Yeah. Uh, as no. in, and it got to do with, with Brunel, the, the guy that's uh, in England, the engineer. No, he's, he's Brunel, isn't he? Yeah, he's Brunel. Um, I think yeah. he's the guy that's, that built the, the, the big ship. Well, I can't think of the name of the ship. It's called Cross the Atlantic, a big steel ship. Um, mm. I can't think of the name of that ship. And he did the bridge in Tifton in, in, in Bristol. I did, Brunel did a lot of, of engineering well, works. You know, well, yeah. You see the name Brunel, it usually has a connection with the plumbers or, you know, some. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's a name that they carried, you know. And you look, you don't have to carry a name like that. Yeah. There's some names that are ridiculous names altogether, you know. They're looking. Yeah. But because they I don't believe, believe it or not, Dean, the name Dean is one of the names associated with the tribes of Galway. Really? Yeah. The 12, uh, the 12 um, tribes of Galway, well, they're really not Irish names, most of them, as, as Brown is one of them. And some of them were Irish names, some of them were not. But Dean was, uh, but Deans and Darcy's were two of the of the Galway tribes. And uh, the, the name Dean has died out a fair bit now. There are very few Deans around altogether. Yeah, you, you don't see many. No, yeah. you wouldn't come across the name much. That is yeah. Dixie, Dixie Dean did a book on the um, oh, the gatehouses, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the great, the great gate lodges. He did a book on the gate lodges. Well, in four sections, he did it. He did Munster, Munster, Munster Dublin is the biggest one, really. He yeah. did gate lodges of Ireland. I say, in ancient Saudi states that had gate lodges. Springfield, is, Springfield is probably in it. But no, all... I don't ever remember the gate lodge in Springfield. Was there? Um, was there ever gate lodges? No, there, 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 but the, the gate lodges that were there were the one at the front gate. There's a, a cottage there, um, which was, but it was, that cottage was built 
in, in the 1929 or 1930 by Bob and Scary when he came back. And there was a back gate lodge, the one that goes to that road which leads to Broadford. Yeah. And that apparently was a, an old stone double story lodge on that corner, but he knocked it down and made a single story. And some of the people who worked on the farms lived in those two uh, when I first went there as a child in those yeah, two lodges. Yeah, I don't ever remember a gate lodge. Uh, uh, there was no proper uh, gate lodge that, yeah. that I'm aware of. Yeah, yeah. I, can't, I can't visualize one anyway, you know, because uh, some of them have survived. And then there's, of course, there's problems with, with gate lodges I've heard over the years with new owners coming to places. Who's going to live in the gate lodge? And who has rights to the gate lodge, you know, especially if they're yeah. big families. And then, but that's that's a story for them there. But I that some of them have some of the lovely buildings that have survived over the years. Yeah. Some of the yeah. gate lodges, and a lot of them were built. They were allowed to be built on the actual land. They were built across the road, on some yeah. of them. and some of them had no windows. Believe it or not, they don't. I usually window the front. No other windows around, as in Heatfield. There's another house there, not far, very far away, called Heatfield. Yes. And uh, it's over near, what's he feeling near town? Near Ballingarry, over towards Ballingarry. There's a lovely gate lodge in that now going in. But like that, there are no, oh, sorry, the windows are around the side and at the back. It's just so the door in the front. Looking, nothing looking down the front. Yeah, they didn't want you kind of looking out as, as, as they pass <laughs> by, you know. You couldn't, you couldn't be looking out to see who was going in and out. But still, you had to be there to open the gates and to shut the gate, I'm sure. You know, yes, yeah. very handy thing to have that, you know. You know, a, a gate lodge going into your house, you know. <laughs> <Security>. <laughs> well, I will ask you, Bob, what, what are you working at? I presume you're doing, you're working, you're not twiddling your thumbs all day anyway. No, I, no I, I'm, I'm still involved in, in some engineering stuff, but minor, I am, um, when I came to South Africa, I started working in, in engineering and eventually I was running um, a, a big company which built ships and um, for the international market. And then some of my colleagues and myself bought a company which was in the international uh, shipping, ship repair mainly and shipbuilding. And I sold that company in 2015 when I retired from, uh, you know, full-time work. So I still do other stuff, but that was my main, um, because I did, I, I, when I, I went to, uh, to school in Dublin and I went to Trinity and did engineering. And when I finished engineering, it, it was very um, difficult times in Ireland in terms of jobs and, yeah, economy yeah. and it was hard. So yeah. I decided to go back because my um, connection to South Africa, I knew some people here and so on. So I got involved in the engineering here and, and worked on that for many, many years. Yeah, and then I sold that place in 2015. And then I have since then have been living uh, a, re a relative life of ease, you know, not stressful, but I still do odd work here and there that interests me. It's not, oh, yeah. Yeah, which, yeah. Is, which is great. Oh, how, why, were you, why were you drawn to ship? You know, is, did you specialize in that type of engineering or is it, did you branch into it? How did you? Yeah, it, 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 you know, it's like most things in life, you get led into it. It's, it, it wasn't deliberate. I was an engineer, so I was employed when I came to work as a civil engineer. Yeah. And the company I worked for was a very big company, which was involved in steel construction of all types. So I was involved in putting up steel buildings and so on. Yeah. So um, eventually, I, I um, over, over a period of a number of years, I was eventually the uh, managing director of that company, which was a big company. We had about two and a half thousand people working there. Um, and then their main activity was building these uh, ocean, uh, ocean container vessels for owners in Europe and elsewhere around the world. And um, I well, left company and then I got the opportunity. Where were the, ship, where were the ships physically built? What, what? I was going to ask, could they actually build? Where, where yeah, they built these in, ships? They built in South Africa. All right. Yeah. Completely built there. Yeah, they, we, the, the, the company had all these facilities, docks and steelworks. It was, South Africa was quite strong industrial. You know, when you look at apartheid, 
one of the things that happened is because South Africa couldn't um, couldn't deal and acquire stuff easily overseas, they developed a lot of local industries. And the result of that was that they then got the capacity to do this. And then as things eased, we had a lot of uh, German owners who built ships, um, you know, big, they're big container ships. And so that was done. And it was interesting. And, and I, it was pure chance. So because I worked in the company and then there were opportunities that opened up, opened up like all of us, you go through whatever you do and something happens and you go this direction, that direction. Yeah. So I, I'm delighted. I did, I didn't know anything about ships at all because um, it was all civil engineering, but basically once I moved out of the strict engineering into the management, it becomes a different story. It's, uh, I, I, have to, I have to be smart and say there wouldn't be many ships out here out in Dumcarno when they're just going to <laughs> <laughs> I need to find a piece of water first. <laughs> this, this part of shipping you'd be in Dumcarno. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. I remember I remember asking your father about that, about the, the Percy French sound, you know. Because yeah. when you mention Doom Connor in Ireland, everybody yeah. thinks of the sound, you know, when you mention yeah. Doom Connor, there's only one street in, in Doom well. Connor. But like that, when you mentioned it that, that what part of Ireland you're in, when you mention Doom Connor, oh yeah, they said the sound, you know, that's kind of gave it gave it a bit of fame, it, you know. Uh, now how yeah. he how he came to like the sound, I think that when he was working for the what they call the Board of Works. I yes. think he went around Ireland, you know, and I think he landed outside uh-huh. in Doom Connor one stage, you know. And, uh, yeah, and he, he was also tutor to one of the one of the children. I don't know which one it was. He, he tutored them too. The father said that to me. You now and yeah. I forgot that he did. I remember him saying that to me. He was a tutor, yeah. you know. But like that, he went down there and walked in. He left. He wrote left some lovely songs. Talking of titles, and he talked from Dublin. Any sign of Lord Lucan around uh, around uh, Dublin? So. I haven't. <laughs> Not a sign. <laughs> if, we, if, we see him, if we see him, tell him there's a few people looking for him. I'll tell him. <laughs> I'd, say, I'd say he's well dead by now, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, I think he'd be well over 100 by now, I'd say. He would, yeah. I saw that in some magazine lately. They, yeah. they said as if he'd been alive, you know. A, I forget what age they said he was anyway, but he was really well dead by now. But just in case you ever come across him, let me... Let me know. <laughs> Where did he go to? You know, but this fabulous. Some of the some of the, the, the conspiracy theories out him. You know, funny. Some of the, oh, you know, right. it's crazy I mean, what people theories they come up with about what. Ah, just funny. Yeah. There's there's certain things that will never they'll never kind of leave them alone. You know, that's one out that um the people in England keep bringing up all the time as to yeah. what happened to him. You know, uh, it's like who, who shot who shot who shot Kennedy. You know. Oh God, yeah. It goes on forever. It goes on forever. <laughs> oh God, beautifully. Anyway, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Tom. You never explained about the green jacket. Why did they, did he want a green jacket? Was he hunting, or like why did he want a green velvet jacket? His father. I um, think something he was going to some function. I think was it when I made the jacket for your father. I think he was going to some function. Same you, know, you know what I think it might have been. There was some function the McCarthy's were having. Oh, the McCarthy clan. Yeah, yeah. could have been that. You, I, I, I don't. You know, I wasn't there, but yeah, this is in the seventies now. This would be yeah, about seventy. I'm only guessing now, about 76, 76, 77, This would be. When it I could be. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Yeah. I'm not aware of that, but it, it was. Yeah, probably something like that, or maybe he wanted to just sit in front of the fire and smoke his cigarettes and green jacket. <laughs> no, <laughs> just too big for that. It was a proper. It was a proper. Um, a smart uh, one. Uh, jacket. Yeah, it was a, I, I did not. Well, the smoking jacket would be much that bit softer, you know. That's no. Yeah. It was a. It was a proper jacket. Yeah. She was. Sorry, the time. If it had a gold trim, I'd say he was going to South Africa, you know, with the green and gold. Oh, well, oh no, sorry, no, no gold trim in it, no. It's just a plain green jacket. And Frankie, Frankie O'Connor actually was going to something else that he wanted that for. But Frankie was killed afterwards in a car accident in Spain. I remember, you know, Frankie yeah. was nice, but he, he was very, he'd, he'd admit to your father anyway, I tell you, to look at him, you know, what I can remember. <laughs> Frankie was very big. You know, yeah. Yeah. Dead, nice man. Anyway, come here. We're coming up. We're coming. Sorry, 
So that right. we're going up to the finish and say, we're, we're talking 50 odd minutes already. You know? All right. It, it, it flies when you're interested, you know, the time okay, flies. Yeah. And there's so many things. My mind is kind of on overdrive here. There's things that I could bring up about South Africa that, you know, you keep thinking, what else can I ask him, you know? But I'm mm. really more interested in the title. And I'm sure people will be very curious when you forget about the Muscari. How did you how did you pronounce it again? What is it? Lord what? Muscari. You could say Muscari or Muscari. Yeah. Yeah, I don't laugh at the idea. Which, which, whichever you like. I mean, yeah. you know, no, I, I don't know what's right. I laugh at the idea of a uh, pronunciation. She's like the Earl of uh, the Earl of Drogheda. He likes to be called the Earl of Drogheda. Oh, okay. Suppose, the weeks say Drogheda. He says Drogheda. Yeah. And uh, London, London, London Derry. The, the Marquis of London Derry is known as known as the Marquis of London Londonry. It's London pronounced London. Yeah. So if you meet him, don't call him. Uh, make sure you say Londonry. You know when, yeah. you, uh, when you when you when you when you meet him. If you meet him the next time, you know. Anyway, uh, but anyway, Bob. Just uh, first of all, anyway, I'd like to thank you for coming on. Well, it's and, a pleasure. Uh, it's, it's been interesting it, talking to you. It's interesting, you know, and it's good for history, for local history. To, as I said, to let people know that there is somebody out there uh, with the title, because people are, are very curious about titles. The best example I can give you on that, on, on the software, was um, uh, the, 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 oh God, I can't give his name. What's his name? Cunningham. I can't give his name this minute now. Explain. Uh, uh, Say, uh, yeah. Uh, he called it the Marcus of Cunningham. He, hmm. he was under, uh, was, no, there's another, he's another sub, subtitle under his name now. I can't think what he's, he was known as. He lives in Slane Castle anyway, up in Slane, in, in, in near Dublin. He said on a, on, a, on a television program that he said he rang up, he rang a restaurant looking for the seas. And he said his name was, I can't give his first name, we'll call him Frank anyway, Frank Cunningham. The restaurant said they were full. He just said he tried this and said they were full. There was nothing they could do for him. So he put down the phone and said, thank you. Rang the same restaurant back about, gave it about 10 minutes and rang back and said, hello, this is uh, the Marcus of Cunningham here. Would you have a table? And he said, the, the waiter said, you're just in luck. We have one table. <laughs> and he got it as, 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 yeah, to use the title. So the next time you're ringing up, uh, you should use the title more, you know. It might get you more, you know. Well, you it might, maybe, yeah. Give me well, something. It, anyway. it certainly would if you were in England. Yeah. Would, no, you know, I suppose it is. Yeah, that's yeah. still kind of... Uh, well, that's historically, that's yeah. good uh, for his history, you know, to know. Uh, to me, anyway, to know the title is there. When you're checking up the breads. Marty Towers used to joke about that, you know. If, Lord, if a Lord rang in, he'd be fighting all of them. If anybody else rang in, he'd abuse them, you know, in Marty Towers. Oh, yeah. Well, that was used by John Cleese. John Cleese yeah. did a series yeah. on that, where he had the Lord coming in, you know. And he found yeah. out... <laughs> In the briefcase, all he had were two bricks in yeah. the briefcase, you know. He was, he was a con man, you know. Anyway, Bob, first of all, anyway, to thank you for myself and Tom for coming on and talking about local history. And I'm sure that um, people will see this, they'll be very curious, you know. This should be up in a couple of days on the website. And uh, right. I'll let you know anyway, as soon as it's up, I'll send well, you an email. But, no. but well, it's uh, you, sorry, just interrupt you again. You find things like communications now with emails. Aren't they fantastic? Oh, fantastic. I mean, yeah. you look at the Zoom and so on, the stuff we can do now. Yeah. And, of course, COVID has made it us use it so much more. Um, That's true. Yeah. It, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah it's just, but communications have come on so much in the past. Even yeah. 10 years they've come oh, on, you know. Big, big uh, difference. Yeah. I mean, how did you manage years ago now? If you were to ring home from Dublin, how did you manage? How would you have managed? You mean from to South Africa? Yeah. If you were to ring from Colorado. You, you had to book a call. I know years and years ago, you know, just if you wanted to, I remember as a, as a child living in, in Limerick, calling my father, calling someone in South Africa, you had to book a call and it, it, would, oh, it would take ages. And it was a huge cost, you know, Gosh. in those days. Yeah. Oh, it was expensive. You couldn't sort of do that every day. Oh. Yeah. No, you don't even yeah. you don't even pay with WhatsApp and all these other things. It's amazing. Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic, really. You know. Anyway, again, to thank you, Tom, and for coming on, and to thank you, Bob. As I said, to tell people, you're the night, Alan. 
Was great. Not much criteria. Oh God! Wait, let's wait, let's tell, wait, let's tell Betty, You know, anyway, right. to, to thank you again, Bob. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Tony. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Bye. Bye.